G'day guys, it's Rodney from I Comply, and we're here for another segment of Having a Yarn on the Farm, where we talk about all things farming. And today I've got a very special guest. Uh, I'm gonna have a yarn today with a very large grazier and also the Shadow Minister for Agriculture here in Queensland, and also a member for Gympie, Mr. Tony Perrett. Tony, thanks for having a yarn with us. Yeah, morning, Rodney. Mate, um, I want to thank you for agreeing to have a yarn. I um, I reached out to the, the Minister for Agriculture um, to come on the program and have a yarn because there's multiple issues up here in Queensland which farmers want to try and get some clarity. Unfortunately, he didn't get back to me. I put a call through to him and he never got back to me. And uh, I followed that up with an email and uh, I'm still waiting to hear back. And I'm actually a little bit surprised at that because Whenever I watch Question Time and I see him, he doesn't seem to be listening. He always seems to be down on his phone checking his emails. So I don't know if mine went through to junk or uh, what was the case, but I'm waiting to hear back from him. And uh, maybe one day I might, uh, be as it may, he's got some major problems here in Queensland that he needs to address. First up, I'm going to ask you, do you think he's addressing them? Look, I'm frustrated like many people in the bush uh, and that, that are linked to agriculture, just with the government's policies and their commitment uh, to advancing uh, agriculture here in Queensland. And Rodney, as you know, there's a great diversity uh, in agriculture. When you look at beef, sugar, you look at horticulture, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, you know, crops that link into it, cotton, grain crops, there's just an enormous uh, diversity in, in agriculture. Uh, and it is in a very, very important uh, component of the Queensland economy and has been uh, for more than a century. Uh, so it's important that uh, that the leaders within agriculture, and particularly the minister, uh, understand their portfolio and, and are strong advocates around that cabinet table. If, if I speak to a lot of growers and not only through my podcast platform, but my business I comply um, is a compliance business that goes out and um, helps growers with regulatory compliance and over the last 12 months, I play a lot in the horticultural space and we've faced our challenges with labour crisis and uh, border closures and not getting any clarity about who we can and can't bring into the, the state. Um, if, if you ask any of the growers, the general consensus that I'm getting is there's no one in, op in Parliament at the moment as far as the current administration that has that farming background that has a seat at the table. And the biggest thing all the growers say to me is, mate, no one gets farming. And it's it's absolutely ludicrous with agriculture being such a big part of the Queensland economy that there aren't specialised people sitting around the table that have runs on the board in agriculture. I mean, I, I don't know anybody in, I don't I certainly don't know Mr. Ferner's background, if he was involved in agriculture or not but there seems to be a distinct lack of knowledge at the table when it comes to the ag sector in Queensland. Do you think that's a fair assumption? Yeah, look, Rodney, I think it is. Uh, you've got to, in this portfolio, you've got to have a clear understanding of uh, what it takes to be involved in agriculture. Uh, and if you don't have that, uh, it's difficult to be able to, to push back against uh, the ideological views that come from you know, different sectors across the state, and we all know what they are. Uh, it's important that you understand the, th those those issues, um, and and if you if you if you don't have that background, it is really difficult to have the passion that's needed to be able to argue argue forcefully, particularly around that cabinet table. And that's that's where uh, that's where the decisions are made for agriculture here in Queensland. And we've seen, you know, in the last 25, 30 years, uh, some very very poor decisions that haven't supported agriculture. Uh, there's enormous potential in a state like Queensland. Uh, to grow agriculture and there's and some key components that are that are linked into that. Uh, but if you don't have a government that's willing to back back agriculture, but more importantly, invest into the key infrastructure that's that's required to support agricultural growth, uh, then agriculture stagnates. Uh, and yes, at the moment there's different sectors of the agriculture that are doing you know reasonably well. But Jesus, a lot of a lot of you know, commodities and a lot of industries that are that are struggling. And and I, I see those as I travel around the state and talk you know to various producers, Rodney. So. Look, it is important. Um, it's something that I obviously have a clear passion for because I've, I've grown up in agriculture uh, and, and still invested into agriculture and will be uh, for my entire life. I think that, um, you know, you have a certain level of credibility to speak on behalf of farmers because you're a farmer yourself. Don't tell, uh, tell the people that don't know 
um, about you, a little bit about your operation. Um, 15,000 acres, I think, up in Gympie. Um, you've been a grazier for a long time. Tell us a little bit about your operation up there. Yeah, well, Rodney, I, I grew up in Kingaroy, so we grew up there on a mixed uh, agriculture you know, uh, farming operation there. So where we had cattle and horses, but uh, we, where we grew peanuts, unsurprisingly, at Kingaroy, uh, amongst other crops. Uh, and so I had a had a, uh, a connection with, with with both sides, Rodney. But the thing that challenged that and why I moved away uh, from that farming was because it was dry land farming. Um, I saw so many times where we had you know, crops that looked like they were going to, you know, produce above average yields and for no fault of anyone's. Uh, the rain didn't come at the right time and then those crops uh, either failed or you know, produced well below what they, you know, their, their potential. Um, so, and always had a love for, for cattle and horses. So very fortunate we moved to Kilkeven, so 50 kilometers west of Gympie, uh, back in the late 90s and invested into a property there uh, where we run a couple of thousand head of cattle. Uh, so I have a real passion for that, uh, but have an understanding of uh, you know, what's required, particularly in you know, the farming sector uh, and, and the need for water security uh, across this state. It's, it's imperative that, that we have that, Rodney. So look, there's different different angles that I come at. I, I spent, I spent uh, 13 years in local government. So I was a deputy mayor of the former Kilkeven Shire back in the early 2000s. Uh, went through the amalgamation of councils in 2008 uh, and then served as deputy mayor of the Gympie Regional Council where I was then elected into the Queensland Parliament in early 2015. It's, it's been a tough time for graziers with regards to, and you mentioned water security and the importance of it. You know, we're, we've been through a hell of a drought. And uh, just last week, I, I was having a yarn to one of my best mates uh, that I went to school with. I went to the King School at Parramatta and his family had got 20 odd thousand acres um, in between Cooler and Cassilis um, in central New South Wales. Uh, Paul Hereford stud called Dow Keith. And yep, yep. During the drought, you know, they had, a, you know, two, two and a half to 3,000 registered stud cattle that obviously they had to move on and their, their, um, their herd dwindled down to about 60 and yep. two and a half thousand. Now they're, they're trying to rebuild. What a lot of people don't understand about the effects of a drought is to rebuild, you're talking a hundred years of, um, family building that herd yes um, it's going to take a hell of a long time for them to rebuild that um, this is where we look at all these problems that have happened with the drought you bang on the money tony water security is so vital so these problems don't happen again look you're right look and i can i can empathize you know with those people particularly you know with with uh, beef herds uh, the genetic selection that's gone into those herds over a long period of time um, is something that's built up as uh, generations uh, and to see that taken away through, you know, not not poor management, just through, you know, circumstances where you've got year on year a sort of drought um, that goes on for years, um, has a significant, you know, direct impact on their financial security, but more important, you know, their emotional uh, you know, situation where they put their life and you know, their heart and soul into what they, they do, Rodney. So it is, it's something that that is, you know, that, that that's, you know, close to me and, don't worry, we saw it back here you know, two or three years ago, uh, 2019, uh, where we had to make those decisions as well, like, like everyone, to produce our herd. I uh, looked after our female herd in particular, so you know, when the rains did come, uh, like we're receiving at the moment, that we can actually then build back our breeder herd. But that takes, uh, in some case, years, Rodney, right, to be able to do that. Uh, even just like carving patterns that, 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 came, that come from uh, those sort of circumstances. And while we can manage, you know, through drought, probably a little bit, you know, better than, than uh, dry land, uh, you know, agricultural farmers and grain farmers, uh, water security is the key uh, to the future agriculture in this state. There is no two ways about it. Where you see secure water schemes, uh, where, uh, you know, farmers have the ability to be able to invest knowing that that water is there, uh, is, is something that they'll do uh, and then can provide that certainty uh, in that investment and then ultimately to the supply of that produce uh, into the markets. Tony, one of the biggest things that worries me is the succession planning in agriculture and where we're going to get the next generation of farmers. Um, I go out to a lot of farmers places and when I talk to farmers you get to their house and you get that country hospitality with a cup of tea and a scone and all the family photos are usually adorning the wall and uh, what I'm seeing a lot of now is a lot of my farmers' sons and daughters moving to the cities and getting jobs. I was with a farmer the other day that uh, 
turned around and said to me, he said, mate, my son's working for an accountancy firm in Brisbane. My daughter's working for an architectural firm in Adelaide. They've both left the farm. He made me aware of something which I wasn't aware of. And he said, you know, Rod, he said, how the hell are we going to get the next generation of farmers when all the ag colleges are closing? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, mate, ever since the Labor government come into power, they've closed Burdekin, they've closed Dolby, they've closed Longreach, they've closed Emerald. He said, if anyone wants to go out onto the farm now, where are they going to get the education? Um, Tony, is this a fact? Look, you're dead right, Rodney. Uh, and it concerns me enormously just to see the, the, the next generation, the younger generation moving away uh, from farms. And look, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's not difficult to understand why they've been doing that. Um, if, it, if, if farms aren't profitable, then of course you're not going to get the younger generation that have that interest. And then, then you've got to link the training into that. And we've seen in recent times uh, the closure of the Emerald and Agricultural Training College and also the Longreach Partial College. Um, so there's no agricultural training colleges left. Uh, and, 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 and that disappoints me to think that you've got a government that At the that time, we're such a big primary producer. How does that happen? Look, I, 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 look, Rodney, only the minister can explain. He was the one that commissioned the report to close these colleges. Uh, and I've said plenty about that in the parliament. I don't understand why they don't. And not only that, Rodney, not only that, uh, and, and I do know this, uh, the, the state government used to support a program called um, Skilled to Industry Partnership Programs, and they withdrew their funding to that program that was an industry-led uh, initiative um, only back three or four years ago that exposed high school students to a future in agriculture. And, and Rodney, we must start, um, not leave it till after school, we must start through edu you know, agricultural education programs and courses within high schools to, to present an opportunity for young people to go into agriculture. But Rodney, this government, and, and you're dead right, over the last 30 years, and it's not this current government, but Labor governments, have successively closed these colleges, uh, and, and it's to the detriment of the future agriculture here in the state. How we, how we got onto the subject of that is, you know, my mate was telling me um, he's got a large, um, he grows sheep. So, um, you know, obviously after the drought, it's easier to bounce back your numbers on sheep than it is with cattle. So he bounced back his numbers with sheep. But he used to pay, I think, three bucks fifty to shear a sheep. He's paying six this year. Um, yes. Six dollars to shear a sheep, which is double. And he said, mate, he goes, there's no once upon a time shearers could go and get some education and you know go to a college and learn all these things. There's nothing out there now. He said, mate, I'm bugging yeah. if I know where we're going to get the next generation of shearers. He's actually yeah, really but, concerned. Yeah, yeah. no, Rodney. I, well, that's what it is, and that's but that's across uh, all commodities, Rodney. Everywhere I travel, uh, there's shortages. Um, you know, even in the beef industry, you see see shortages. Um, and and even Rodney, even into uh, and while this is not you know, it, it's, it's, it's related to agriculture, even in abattoirs. Mm. Uh, I know local like abattoir in Gympie, 100 workers short. Uh, if they could, you know, they've, they've made the investments into the technology within that, that abattoir, but they also need the workers uh, that, that, you know, on the ground within those abattoirs to be able to process. Uh, Rodney, it's a problem everywhere. It's, it's quite extraordinary. And, and look, there may be a myriad of reasons for it, but if you don't have a government that's focused on dealing with the issues and investing and working with industry organisations, uh, you're no, never going to solve the problem, Rodney. Well, I'll tell you something now, the last 12 months in, in horticulture, you know, and I actually had a call from a guy in Gympie, believe it or not, where you're from, a couple of yep. weeks ago that grows garlic. And, yep. um, you know, we've got a labour hire business as well. He said, Rod, he goes, uh, you know, I need 30 workers urgently because he's harvesting garlic right now. And I said to him, I said, well, I said, mate, how many you got? He said, me, my wife, my brother, my son. Yep. He said, that's what we've got harvesting garlic right now. He said, yep. we're going to need another 26. Yep. It is that dire out there with the labour crisis. And no matter which area you talk to, um, it's absolutely dire. And what, what I guess all farmers are, are crying out for is, and I love what the, the new opposition leader, David Christopherly, um, and I've been following him a lot, David comes out and says, you know, you can you can be smart, but you can also have a heart. And, yes. you know, you can make decisions, but also have a little bit of common sense. Um, you know, I've been advocating for 12 months to try and get workers in from Vanuatu. And yep. in Vanuatu, there's been zero COVID cases. Yes. Okay? None, nada. So there's probably 500 workers sitting there now waiting to come to Australia. Yes. Now, 
Chief Health Officer here in Queensland wouldn't allow us to bring in workers from Vanuatu, from a country with no COVID, because yep. they might bring in COVID. Yes. Yep. Okay, so yep. they might bring in COVID from a country that doesn't have COVID. Yes. I mean, as stupid as it sounds, this woman with multiple degrees got up and said, we can't bring them in because they might bring in COVID from a country that doesn't have COVID. Now, Jacinda Arden over in New Zealand, she listened to her farmers and she said, you know what? There's no COVID in Vanuatu. Bring them all in quarantine free. As many as we can tomorrow, right? Yes. And they sent plane loads, plane loads, plane loads. Now, all those, now the borders are open, are uh, opening and there's less quarantine. And, you know, we're in a position where, oh, well, we can now bring in those Vanuatu workers. Guess where they are, Tone? They're all in New yes. Zealand picking fruit. That's right. We've missed the boat. Yes. And the, the procrastination and the the hard headedness and arrogance not to not to listen to find problems, it's costing us and costing us dear. I'll tell you in the horticultural sector, the labor crisis isn't going to be solved for another 12 to 18 months. And even right now, you know, in New, in New South Wales, in Melbourne, in Adelaide. I mean, the, the leader over in Adelaide, the premier over there, and I, I don't know who he is, but there are a lot of growers in Adelaide. Mate, he's moved mountains to help farmers. He's yeah. listened to all the farmers and said, how can I help? And he's brought plane loads of seasonal workers in. He hasn't procrastinated. He hasn't put up roadblocks. He hasn't said, you got to go quarantine here, there and everywhere. Um, he's just made stuff happen, which as a politician, that's what you got to do. You got to make stuff happen. Doesn't seem to be a lot of stuff happening with regards to farmers at the moment in the Queensland government. No, look, Rodney, you make an excellent point um, in and around that. And it's so frustrating because solutions can be found. You've got to, you've got to find a pathway to sort these things. Uh, and, and unfortunately, and, and I don't mind saying this, the Queensland government uh, haven't had that clear focus of, of wanting to deliver uh, for the farmers in this state. Um, the solutions have been there and you've articulated those particularly well. Uh, we've all known that, uh, but ultimately it was up to the Chief Health Officer and the government to pro provide that, that accreditation for them to come into the state, uh, and they should have done it. And, and Rodney, you'd know better than I, but I've been on farms and only just recently up in the Vertica, where there's crops just rotting in the field because there's no one there to pick them. And, and I know earlier this year, and I know horticulturists made decisions not to plant crops based on the fact that there's no one to pick them. Now, that, that should never be the case in a state like Queensland. Uh, but when you see those crops rotting on the ground, and I suspect even in my own electorate, and as you mentioned, you know, with the, the, the local farm with the garlic, um, that those crops simply won't be picked because if they haven't got those 30 workers there to do it when they need it, they're not going to be going to be picked or there's certain, certain sections of those, those paddocks that just will, will be left to rot. I'll tell you one thing that, and you know, you touched on water security and the importance of it. I do a lot of work in Stanthorpe and yep. you know we the drought and the, the issues down there have been well documented the last yes. couple of years yep. um, i had growers last year paying 25 thirty thousand dollars a week cutting in water to keep yep. their crop alive um, those two one of the largest growers down there that was carting in water and paying that sort of money um, mate he went broke and he's closed up okay he was the largest yes. here yep. pines was the largest tomato producer down there um, you know he went under Right now in Stanthorpe, and I spend a lot of time down there, they've had truckloads of water over winter. The yes. dust's broken, the dams are full. But more importantly, the crop is looking outstanding. It's looking the yes. best it's ever been. Anything from apples to peaches to, you know, you name it, the tomatoes, capsicums, strawberries, everything down there is looking fantastic. Now, these growers have done deals with the banks over the last couple of years, deferring loan mm. payments as a lot of farmers do in the drought. They try to work with their financiers and defer. I was talking to a grower the other day and he said, you know, Rod, he said, I've had two years since Stanthorpe of pain. He said, I've done divert, deferred payments with the bank. Yep. He said, the bank are now, hey mate, you've got water, you yeah, know, yep. how's it looking? We don't want just this year's mortgage payments. We want last year's as well. Go on. He's looking at his crop and it's going to be a bumper one. And he's got no one to pick it. No, no, no. And that to me is an absolute travesty. And the Labor government are clueless to this. And the reason why they're clueless to this 
is they're not identifying the problems. They know there's a problem. Yes. But they don't know how to deal with it. No, no, look, Rodney, you, you, you're exactly right. And look, you know, we've seen that, you know, and look, we can talk about Emu Swamp Dam and all the tr troubles there, but, but look, you have to have that labour force. And when there's a ready labour force, as, you, as you've identified, and, and as we well know, you just need the government to put the right protocols and be active around making certain that we get those people in. If the people weren't available, then that'd be another challenge. But we know those Vanuatuans and, and, and others from those Pacific Islands uh, love coming to Australia and they're great workers. I know the, the horticulture, the farmers love having them. And particularly when they come back year after year. Um, Roddy, there, there is a solution. And other states have found that, be it New South Wales and South Australia. And, and, and that's been presented uh, to the Queensland government, to the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, but because of their their hard-headedness and the way that they've managed the you know, the, the, the COVID situation, um, there's there's a lot of businesses um, that um, have either failed or uh, are in the process of failing. And and while interest rates are low, it still doesn't mean that banks don't come knocking on your door. Uh, and and we need those farmers to take take this state forward, uh, not only to yeah you know, to pr provide you know, this state and this nation with the food that it needs, but more importantly, Rodney, to ex export. Uh, as we know, 70% of what we produce in this country is exported. Correct. Uh, but if we don't have uh, those farmers and that labour force and that confidence to invest, Rodney, we fail. And and it's getting more and more challenging. And I, and I see that in my region, like the, the cost of land and, and a lot of that cost of land, you're know, farming land. And look, no better example in the Mary Valley with the you know, the, the failed Traveston Dam by the Beattie government back in the mid 2000s, mm. uh, where a lot of dairy farms uh, left that region. Uh, we've now got a situation where those properties uh, are now back in you know, private ownership after that failed proposal from the BD government, uh, but they're lifestyle properties, so they're not getting work as agricultural properties. Uh, the people that generally own them are out of Brisbane or off, off the Sunshine Coast, uh, run a handful of horses and a you know, couple of cows. Um, but, so Rodney, there's more and more pressure coming on agriculture all the time, uh, and we can't afford to have failures within the system, and uh, particularly where there's clear solutions, and as you correctly identify, uh, New Zealand didn't see it as a problem. Uh, those workers went straight in there and that could have easily happened here in Queensland. Yeah, I think the difference with New Zealand is, you know, they don't run a federation state just in a hard and made a decision and boom, it happened. Where yes. here, you know, the federal government can only do so much and, you know, they're, they're butting their heads against the wall with the state governments. Yeah. And yeah. and that that's, that's just absolutely crazy. This whole PCR debacle the last couple of days with the 150 bucks, you know, if you want to know a real assumption, you talk to a farmer and yes. a farmer will always give you his take. And one of my growers rang me yesterday and he's like, Rod, he goes, have you seen this 150 bucks that they got to pay? I said, yeah. He said, mate, he goes, have you ever been down the Fortitude Valley and seen the backpackers in all the pubs? And I went, yeah. He said, which pubs do they go to? The pubs that don't charge a cover charge. The ones that don't have yep. a cover charge to get in. He said, we're trying to charge a cover charge now, and all they're going to do is go to New South Wales or Queen Victoria where there ain't no cover charge. It's a pretty funny analogy, but bang on the money. continue. <laughs> Uh, be the be the government. Uh, we're, you know, well, I know it's popular. It is the whole with this has been based on polling by the Crown uh, on a weekly basis to work out public policy. No, it's not do basically. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, farmers and horticulturists are the collateral damage in what this government has done uh, in the last, you know, particularly the last 12 months. Yes, we understand the lockdowns initially and you know, to, to, to deal with that, but there's been solutions uh, to find, you know, for, for, for these sorts of problems that we have here in the Queensland, Rodney. And farmers will soon work it out uh, because they're pretty practical, straight up and down sort of sort of people. Geez, and geez, I'll tell you what, the situation, the situation might be a little bit different if, uh, you know, there was a different party in opposition and we'd have, you know, a Premier that's a son of a cane farmer and a Minister for Agriculture that's a grazier. We'd, uh, we'd have a few people on, uh, with a seat at the table that actually understand agriculture, wouldn't we? Well, we would. And and what I've seen, and look, I've, this is my third team in competition, so by the time I finish, it'll be 10 years, Rodney. And I get particularly frustrated knowing the opportunities there and knowing what government needs to do uh, in, in, in the, their areas of responsibility and, and their areas of responsibility in that key infrastructure spend, Rodney. 
If, 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 if they do what they need to do, then you get the private sector that has the confidence to borrow and invest. It's as simple as that. Um, but but we see across the state, Rodney, there's, look, and once again, I've experienced this through local government, and, and I see it uh, now uh, sitting, sitting in the opposition. We're 10 years behind an infrastructure spend in this state, Rodney, we are. And as soon as you, you get behind an infrastructure spends, then it becomes particularly di difficult. And we see what they try to do with South East Queensland, where they try to retrofit mm. infrastructure to there, it becomes particularly difficult and prohibitively dear. Now, we need to make certain that we get get you know get into greenfield sites, we get out and invest. I was, I was only talking to a farmer in Hippie yesterday uh, that's moved out of agriculture uh, in an area you know not too far west of where I am. And he said, Tony, if only the government had built some weirs on this creek, you know, all the studies, everything's been done, uh, then I would have had certainty around my you know, farming future. But he said, because I didn't have that water security, and it gets back to that water security again, Rodney, in so many cases, I've moved out of agriculture. Now that's a great shame, someone that grew up in agriculture, but but you know, because they couldn't get that certainty around uh, around water, Rodney, they moved away. And it's, look, that's, it's that's not, a travesty. When you get generational farmers going, you know what? I'm going to have to go and do something different. It's an absolute travesty. Yeah, no, it, it is, and and it shouldn't be uh, in a in a in a in a state like Queensland, Rodney. There's so much opportunity that still remains, but you you, you look, it's it's you, know, you can put these these ideas forward to yeah you know, to the government, to ministers, but unless they have a passion for it, Rodney, it, it doesn't progress. And and you know, I think the fact that you've had dignity in even get the minister for agriculture you know, to talk to you. Uh, you know, well, I can't, I can't even get him to ring me back and I can't even get him to, to email me back. And, you know, I, I have over 40 clients in horticulture in Queensland, over 40, okay? Yeah. I've got yeah. over 300 clients nationally, over 40 in horticulture. One would think he'd pick up the phone and pick the brains of someone like me that's got the year of 40, 40 people yeah. in hort. Yes, yeah. No, look, it's not difficult and it'd be quite easy for Minister Ferner to pick the phone up uh, and talk to you about these various issues, but you know they, they shield themselves from the from the reality of what's going on. Uh, you know he likes to prance around thinking he is the you know the, the friend of the farmer, but uh, that front frustrates me. You know it's 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 actions uh, speak louder than words than words, and we know that Rodney. Uh, lip service doesn't cut it. Uh, it's it's actions. And 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 Rodney, another example, and you'd know this, uh, and, and no doubt you have clients in this area is in that in that you know, Bundaberg region. Look at what's happened with the Traveston, uh, with the sorry, the Paradise Dam. Oh, uh, disgrace! You know, we, we, well, we saw the failure of the Traveston Dam, and the Paradise Dam was built um, not long before that. Uh, the fact that they've torn that down without any commitment to 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 yeah that that water security in that region to, to be able to hold that stored stored water at the same capacity. Uh, is, is something that's a, that's once again a failure of, of various ministers, but particularly the Minister for Agriculture, because Rodney, people have invested millions of tens of millions in that region based on that that initial that water security was in Paradise Dam, and to have it back to 42%, and then have the minister stand up in the parliament last week to proudly tell us that it's that it's uh, that it's by washing, it's overflowing, um, just just uh, tells me that they don't understand you know, the significance of the problem that they've got there. It's not the fact that the water's you know, going over the, the overflow now. It's the fact that you know, the water's not there in times of drought, and, and that's what they need to commit to. I'll tell you what's going to happen now, and I'll, I'll pull out my crystal ball and tell you my take on the labour crisis. Right now, the government are in talks with the uh, eight Pacific Island nations that um, are part of the seasonal worker program about the quarantine free travel. Now, Already yesterday or the day before, we saw 140 Solomon Island workers fly straight into New South Wales, quarantine free to go in to meet works up at um, Mudgee or Bathurst or somewhere yep. up there. Um, Queensland government are still hesitant about who they're going to let in from the Pacific Island nations. Now, they can't not let in Vanuatu quarantine free because there's no COVID. No, but that's right. There's certain, certain crops are better suited by certain nationalities. Like you can't put 120 or 130 kilo Tongan in a strawberry picking trolley. No. Nor, you know, the Timorese are great for that because they're light and nimble. On the flip side, you can't put a 40 kilo, 50 kilo Timorese picking bananas up no. in Innisfail. So yeah. there's different nationalities that, that suit different types of roles. Um, the Palaszczuk government have got this massive white elephant now called Wellcamp. Yes. They've got to find a useful. 
Yes. If my mail is correct and I hear a lot of things, there's going to be a large push to use that to quarantine ag workers because she's got to try and save face for blowing all that money on something yes. that she doesn't need now. Um, yes. That's going to be the next fight. And, you know, once again, another roadblock that's going to be put up for ag, another yes. cost that's yes. going to be, have to be paid by farmers and an unnecessary cost. Like, yes. I've got farmers that have paid $300,000 this year in quarantine fees to bring in workers before they've even started to pick their crop. Now, you can fly straight into New South Wales, Victoria, Adelaide, double vaxxed, COVID test, all the federal yeah. rules, no problem. But here, I guarantee you, you're gonna to have to go through World Camp. Watch this space tone, I guarantee you it's gonna happen. Yeah, Rodney, look, you're spot on. Uh, and it is a white elephant, it's, it's unnecessary. But to try and justify that significant expenditure, and we understand it is significant, uh, while there's been no transparency around what they've done, uh, this commercial incompetence, which is absolute nonsense to justify a, you know, a, a process they put in place that, that doesn't meet the, you know, the, the, the pub test, uh, and it doesn't, um, they'll do that, Rodney. And, and we know, we know uh, that other states have been able to, to yeah, particularly with Benuatu, if, if need be, quarantine those people on those islands if you're so worried about it, then bring them in and put them straight in the field. There are plenty of examples other states have done this so much better than this you know here in Queensland Rodney but you're right um, they were they were hell-bent on opposing what the federal government was doing at Pink and Bar uh, yeah with a the facility there no they progressed with this with this well camp option uh, Queensland taxpayers are going to are funding uh, a major portion of this and, and, and as we understand an ongoing commitment uh, to that facility for a long period of time um, and to try and recoup some sort of cost uh, that that cost will be yeah, will eventually flow back through to farmers, Roddy. You're dead right. Uh, and, and I'd be interested to hear the Minister for Agriculture actually try and explain that. I, I guarantee you, and uh, I can tell you now, that's what's going to happen because oh, the farmers are going to pay. And yeah. it's another example of a decision, you know, farmers this year, all year, we've been casualty of wars with regards to the federal and state war. Okay, the yes. farmers have yes. been a casualty of war. You know, yes. we could one minute we could bring people across the border, next minute we couldn't. You know, I had a mate of mine ring me, okay? He bought out a specialized engineer. He does tomato graders um, mm. and he manufactures tomato graders. And he bought out a specialist engineer that does software upgrades on his graders from Holland. So he flew down to Tasmania. He did all the software upgrades there. Went over to Adelaide, did the software upgrades there. Came to Queensland, couldn't get in because it wasn't known as essential. So. He's emailing Queensland Health, Queensland Health saying, look, this is the only bloke in Australia that can do this. Yes. He's going back home to Holland. And if he comes back, he ain't coming back for five years. Yep. It'll be five years before he's back. If that's not an essential service, I don't know what is. He mm -hmm. had to get into Ballandine to do an upgrade on a tomato grater there. So he's sat in Armadale for two weeks waiting for Queensland Health to get back to him. Yep. Um, I, I then reached out, he rang me and he said, Rod, what, what can what can you do? I reached out to Minister Littleproud, and Minister Littleproud went to Queensland Health, but you know, they shut him down. Um, I reached out to James Lister down there in Southern Downs because James's office was doing a lot of work with a lot of clients on border towns. Um, for three weeks, this guy sat in Armadale, couldn't get hold of anyone, ended up getting the shits and went back to Holland. Yes. Now, that yep. piece of equipment now hasn't got its software upgrades. The farmer's now saying to my mate, well, why should I pay you yep. for you know the maintenance agreement that you got because you couldn't do the maintenance or because of some sort of stupidity um, with regards to the Queensland Health not allowing him across the border. I mean, these are decisions that have affected farmers every day this year yeah, yeah. Uh, one minute we could bring in workers at the start of the pandemic if you're an ag worker you could come across the border next minute yeah. boom you can't um i guess what yeah. farmers want is a little bit of consistency and a bloody fair go time yeah look it's it's the double standards that are frustrating everyone that have been here and and the lack of attention to finding solutions uh, to these things. The, the solutions that are there, it's just mm. that you've got to have a government that's willing uh, to listen and adopt them. 
Uh, and it's as simple as that, Roddy. This is not, this is not, you know, th this has been done in other states. There's plenty of examples how this actually works. Um, but because of the attitude of the Premier and the, and, and the Cabinet, the government, the way they proceeded with this, um, Ronnie, yeah, that's what's led to the frustration and people like that where there was a simple solution um, to it, to, to be able to come across, you know, double vaxxed, everything, the test, everything that they needed. No, no. But look, Ronnie, I'm dealing with that just generally through my office. You know, people that were shut out of this state with two hours notice. Some really tragic uh, situations uh, where people have been stuck across the border uh, and through a heartless government, through a heartless government, we've ended up with situations where people have you know, lost everything I've uh, been sitting at the border, camped in cars. Uh, look, it, it's it's heartbreaking in many circumstances. So it's it's not just directly in agriculture. This is just across the communities, and and that's why we're seeing a lot of frustration at the moment. You know, with with government, you know, policies and and, and where they where they're going with, uh, you know, their certain mandates and the likes is because of the of the double standards and the lack of flexibility and and the heartless attitude in so many cases. And 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 Rodney, plenty of examples, plenty of examples where when they've been exposed through media, all of a sudden there's an immediate solution to it because they don't ah, like the negative. hundred percent. The goes minute, back the minute that Dave Christopher goes yep. after him and raises a spotlight yep. on him, geez, they fix the yep. problem quickly. It they, shouldn't they, be like that though. No, they should be they should be proactive themselves. And, 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 Ronnie, that gets back before talking about, you know, you know good public uh, government policy shouldn't be driven by, you know, weekly polling. Uh, and these 30 spin doctors that the Premier has to curate her image about you know, the way she, she looks in the media. Look, it's, it's just simply wrong, Ronnie, and that's why there's frustration in agriculture, because uh, it, it's not about what's good for agriculture, it's about, well, how, you know, what's best for me? And, and, that's, and that's the way the Premier and the government have conducted uh, you know, this, this whole COVID management, uh, and more particularly in recent times. And, and look, there's plenty of examples. Um, as to why you know the vaccination rates in Queensland were lower than they should have been. Um, because the chief health officer said, "Don't get AstraZeneca." She shit, she made everyone shit at the, the premier, start. That's right, and the premier used every excuse possible not to get AstraZeneca, even though she was eligible. I wanted to get it, and I couldn't get it in my, in my local community uh, because they opened and closed uh, the vaccination centre. It was just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Um, but it's all been about it's all been about the premier's image and 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 what's best for her. Uh, and to try and keep her in government. And, and, and Rodney, the sad reality of what we've got here in this state, we've got another three years uh, of, of uh, this Premier and this government because we're now in four year fixed terms. And that's the great frustration for agriculture um, that, you know, while you know, there's lip service paid to it from time to time, there's not meaningful uh, government policy and action to deal with the, the real issues that, that yeah, farmers confront on a daily basis. Well, I know that um... Yeah, you, you're right. You know, four years is is a long time, and uh, you know, if the last year is anything to go by, we're in for another three years of pain with regards to the ag sector. But I can say it's comforting knowing that we've got people like yourself, Tony. That you know, in your role as shadow ag minister, being from the land is very comforting to farmers, and also the new opposition leader, David Chrisafuli, being the son of a cane farmer, is going to give farmers. You know, if you ask any, you ask anyone, what's the one thing farmers cling to, and that's hope. Yes. We hope it's going to rain. We hope yep. the prices maintain. Yep. You know, we hope that we can find solutions. Farmers cling to hope because that's all we've got. Um, we can only hope that you guys continue putting the pressure that you do put on them um, to keep the bastards honest because that's what needs to happen. Look, Rodney, we'll do that. Uh... I tell you what, though, it's very, very frustrating in a, in a unicameral parliament like we have here in Queensland, where there's no upper house, where there's no house of review like other states have. Uh, so it's winner take all for governments here in Queensland. Uh, and that's the great frustration, because if governments don't want to listen, they won't listen. Uh, and that's what we've got with, with this you know, current Queensland government. Uh, I also have in you know, my portfolio, Rodney, fisheries and forestry. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some significant concern in both those industries. Uh, about the way the government have handled you know, th those areas, particularly in forestry, some significant failings of government policy that goes back to Premier Beattie and, and also the, the current Premier's uh, father, Henry Palaszczuk, back in the 90s um, with regional forest agreements that are failing uh, the timber industry and timber supply in this state. And we've seen it within the, the fisheries industry um, with the sustainable fishing strategy. And the fact that the Queensland Productivity Commission recommended a regulatory impact statement into the regulatory change within the, you know, the, the fisheries industries uh, and Minister Ferner rejected it. 
uh, because he knew what it would say, and it was it's putting fishes out of out of business, mm. um, and and you know generational fishes that are, that know nothing uh, else, uh, that are really sort of struggling with the you know the, the current uh, laws and regulations that are there now, uh, and if there'd been a regulatory impact statement, uh, the government would have had to uh, pay compensation, uh, and that was quite and that's why they rejected it. So. Uh, look, it's frustrating, Rodney. It is, but, but it is, mate. But we can just keep powering along. That's all we can do. Is you know, you guys are doing a great job raising awareness, and you know, that we can just keep shining the spotlight on the problems and hope we can force them into action. Tone, before we go, I want to ask you something completely out of politics and uh, yep. something that you know I followed greatly, and that was the story of Robert Weber. Oh yes, yep. Okay, yep. now back in January. Robert went missing for 18 days on your property. He did. And uh, mate, it must be a hell of a property for a guy to go missing 18 days. And I, I can relate coming from, you know, going, when I went to school, and as I said before, my, my friends that owned Dow Keith, I spent every school holidays up there and their property was 20,000 acres of quite rugged grazing terrain. So I could understand how I could easily get lost up there. but. Mm. He's gone missing for 18 days. His car's on your property. Um, mate, how did you find him? Look, quite extraordinary, Rodney. Look, and, and, and ex very, very lucky uh, that, that, we, that we did. Uh, Rodney, we'd been away for a few days. Mm. Uh, and we come home and I didn't even realise uh, that someone had gone missing or last seen, or reported uh, last seen in Kilkeven. Um, and Rodney, it was one of those situations where a couple of our young fellas were, were mustering out on the, uh, the, the southwest side of our property. Um, and and they found this car, or, or saw this car from quite a distance away, and they called me. I was actually in Gympie uh, at a function on one Sunday morning. I was in there, and they called me. and said, "Tony, you got someone camped out here?" I said, "No." I said, "Well, it looks a bit odd. There's a car." Anyway, I just thought where this car was. That um, is, there a, is, there, is there like a road through fair on your farm, or was it yeah, well, private property, or how, how yeah, did it come no, about? Yeah, we're the we're the last last property at the end of this road. Yeah. Um, and and look, this he, he so with this car. And anyway, they they, they went over and they sort of yep. Yeah, so it's this car. They sent me a couple of photos, uh, and I contacted the, the local police officer, and I, because they knew that someone had been last seen, you know, seen in Kilkeven uh, a few days before. Anyway, uh, it turned out to be his car. Now, it was quite extraordinary how he ended up where he did. So he's in a Ford Falcon. Uh, he went through I think three steel gates up a property track where you'd normally drive up. You know, take a you know a, a Polaris or a yeah. you know a, a road vehicle. Um, it was quite extraordinary where this Falcon ended up. Um, through three steel gates, closed all these gates, and then sat it out there for a while. So when he went in there, he had you know food and supplies, um, not for camping, but uh, some stuff he got. I think he bought a bit of seafood on one of those roadside vending. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And he'd been to the Kilkeven Hotel and had a had a you know had a few beers in his boot and that sort of thing. So he wasn't without supplies for that length of time. But anyway, he did run out of supplies and he sat it out for a while and then he headed off. And and, and that was obviously when we found the vehicle equal, and he wasn't at it. So of course, and there was a full, you know, full scale search and rescue on our property. And, and to, to get an idea of our property, it's all rangeland grazing country. So, you know, quite productive country, beautiful country, but it's all rangeland country. So it's not flat uh, and quite rugged in some, some places. Uh, and he set off. And anyway, there was a search and rescue that went on for four days, Rodney. Um, obviously coordinated by the police, uh, involving his family. And back in January, uh, and, it would have been bloody humid. Oh, yeah, no, it was a bit damp. And I remember on the, the first day on the Monday, I think we ended up with about 35 mil of rain. Extra yeah, about 35 degrees. And look, it wasn't easy. Uh, we had the stock squad there on horseback. We had our people on horseback just searching everywhere uh, on that side of the property, checking all the water points, because of course that's where we thought yeah. we'd find them. Anyway, after uh, I think it was four days of solid searching, including with you know, aerial support, uh, search and rescue, helicopters and the like, uh, there was no sign of him. And anyway, uh, the decision was made by you know, QPS to, to terminate the, the search, thinking that, um, that, he, that he would be dead. Um, and, and it was quite fortunate because it was in January and you know there was no parliament, I wasn't away at the time. And my wife and I just kept looking. Every day we just raced around the, you know, several dams out on that side of the property. We kept, just kept checking them, thinking he'd turn up. Um, and of course he didn't. So anyway, it was on the very last day that I had, I think it was on a Sunday morning. And I, and I said to my wife, I said, we'll set off uh, in our Polaris Ranger um, and we'll search the paddock adjacent to where his car was found again. There was a couple of spots where we hadn't, hadn't been. I thought I'd just go and check them in case he was there. And of course, and look, I hate to say this, but 
I was thinking the best chance of finding him would have been um, still at that stage, even if he he, he was deceased, uh, because yeah, of his body recovery rather than yeah, yeah. The, and yeah. there'd be some sort of yeah sign that yeah you know, that he may have perished in a gully somewhere. Anyway, so so uh, we headed off and we searched this for, you know this this paddock was adjacent about thirteen hundred acres and no no sign of it. And I said to my wife, look, we'll drive down to the bottom of the property for the you know the, the, the final time. So we got a little set of stockyards over on that side of the property. We drove through them up over this crest uh, of this ridge and and there's a dam about 100 metres from this little set of stockyards. And here he was under this one tree beside this dam just frantically waving at us. Oh, uh, and it was, yeah, it was quite extraordinary. Uh, so of course we went down and, and we made that connection and uh, he was barefooted, he'd torn his shirt, he was in dark clothing, but he'd torn his shirt, he was sun, and it, it, it was quite, he was, he was in a, he was a mess uh, when we found him, but, but still, yeah, still upright. Um, so we made that connection, and anyway, we got him uh, in, the, in the Ranger and, and uh, made the 20 minute trek back to uh, the homestead on the property. Uh, managed to get a bit of limited mobile service on one of the top, top of the ridges as we went back. Called the, the local police officer, found him. I said, you know, informing that I found him alive, uh, which were most pleased. You better get an ambulance out here. So anyway, we took him to the homestead and sort of made him as comfortable as we could uh, and waited for about an hour and a half for the ambulance to to arrive and then I put him in the ambulance and took him into the Gibby Hospital. Um, so look, it was quite extraordinary, Rodney. Unbelievable. Hobby. Yeah, and, and, and more so, more so, Rodney, was the fact that he had a dog, so he had a big... Uh, Did you find the dog? Because I looked online and I couldn't see any follow-up story of whether or not you found the dog. And I was no, actually curious. Yeah, no, well, look, he had a dog when he went in there. This was a, this was a strange thing, because I would have thought it, was, it would have been easy to find the dog than it was him. Uh, particularly with the amount of people we had out there and people on horseback. No, there's no sign of the dog. So exactly a week later, uh, this big bull Arab cross uh, bitch um, wandered in to the, the homestead on the property where my daughter was living at the time, a week later. Um, where this dog had been, I have no idea. Um, and and But one thing I do know, Roddy, one thing I do know, um, given given the condition that it was in, it was still quite you know lively and strong, but it lost a lot of condition. That it had it hadn't eaten any of my calves. That was one thing I did. Yeah. Know. <laughs> it was one of the things. No worry, I had a, had a few mates sort of. Geez, especially with cattle that. prices at the moment, you would have had to send him a bill. <laughs> yeah, well, Rodney, look, and this dog had lost a lot of weight, but was still quite strong and active. But a week later, so that that dog had been been in the bush for for the best part of three weeks, uh, and and didn't follow him. And that and that's what I said to him. I said. Uh, Robert, yeah, when we found him, I said, where's your dog? Because I would have automatically thought the dog would have stuck. Have him, no, yeah. dog, dog never followed me, which was quite extraordinary. Uh, so, yes, we found him alive, uh, managed to yeah, get, get him the medical attention that he needed. Uh, and then, and then of course, then a week later, the dog turned up. So, yeah, look, it was one of those things like, Ronnie, this, it, look, who would have ever thought, but but he become, I, I don't know the circumstance, but become disorientated, end up into an area where he should never have ended up with a falcon. Um, uh, but nonetheless, he ended up there and, and we did our best to find him. And, and thank goodness uh, we did keep keep searching because uh, that was the very last day that I had to look for him. Otherwise, there was no way that he was walking out of where he was. So I hope no. once he was out of hospital and all better, he bought you a beer, Tone. Yeah, no, he, he, he uh, there was a, a, a debrief of the whole situation with the Queensland Police Service and, and also the SES uh, a week later. And he made his way there and uh, he was he did bring a couple of cartons of beers <laughs> for everyone that was involved. Uh, <laughs> but look, yeah, it could have, it could have been quite tragic. Oh, uh, absolutely. Who would have thought that happened, Rodney? So no, look, it was just one of those things. You'd, we all did our best. Everyone that was involved did their best. Uh, it was just fortunate that we ended up in the right spot on, on that morning uh, and found him under that tree because, uh, you yeah, know, the, 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 the nearest home home to where he where he actually was found would have been at least another 12 or 15 kilometre walk. Uh, and then for the country, he'd only made his way probably not more than, you know, two, two and a half kilometres from uh, where, uh, yeah, where his car was found. But just um, the circumstances of why we didn't find him, we, we'll never know. Uh, however, we did find him eventually, and that was amazing. Yeah, no, great, great end to a great story. Tone, I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to ask you one question before we go. Cattle prices, yep. all-time high or where they should be? Uh, look, wouldn't it be great if they stopped here? Um, I, I'm not going to set a budget on the current ca uh, cattle prices, and I don't think anyone in the beef industry will. Look, we've seen a lot of, lot of challenges, as we do across all farming uh, uh, businesses, but 
Uh, it's nice to see them where they are, but we know the circumstances uh, that, that, that have developed over years and years of drought, not just here in Queensland, but across the east coast of Australia that have led to this. Uh, but it's nice to see it. Uh, we do produce you know, a quality product here in this, this state. Uh, there is you know, great demand for, for Australian beef, not only domestically, but internationally. Uh, but let's hope they hold, uh, because as we know, when, when agricultural businesses uh, are, are viable and are, and are making a dollar, uh, they reinvest that money back into the communities. Uh, and, and that's what we need. You know, mate, that's, there's not a true word said. And I had, I had a chat with, I had a yarn with James Lister down in Stanthorpe and, you know, Stanthorpe relied on all those backpackers over the years going there to pick and going there to pack. And you go to the RSL on any night of the week and it'd be full of backpackers because they're all earning good coin, they're making good money, um, they were reinvesting it back into the RSL, the pizza shop, yep. the IGA. Um, it's, it's a domino effect in regional towns. When ag's doing good, everyone's doing good. And, they are. you know, you'll see now when cattle prices are good, you'll see the guy that sells the ATVs is going to have a win. You're going to see the guy that sells the Land Cruisers is going to have a win. You're going to see the blokes in town that have all got their little shops, they're all going to have a win because the money just keeps going back into town. So, you know, profitable agriculture doesn't just affect, it, it starts with the, ta the, the town and then has a trickle flow. Yeah, Rodney, it does. And that's what we're seeing at the moment. And, and certainly with the federal government, you know, tax incentives that are there as well, uh, to be able to, you know, to spend and ride off through the instant asset, ride off, I think up to $150,000. So you're getting, you're getting farmers that are reinvesting back into their plant, into their, into their equipment. Uh, and that's important and, 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 and into their capital improvements on their property. It's an excellent time to be able to do that. You know, if, if people are making a dollar, but they've got to be able to make a dollar. And we want all agricultural industries to be profitable because it's not only good for those regional communities, it's good for the state. I think it's, I think most importantly is because they bloody deserve it because agriculture, it's hard yakka. It's hard yakka. It is hard. It is hard yakka. And, uh, and, and don't worry, uh, we, like, while still invested in there, I, I miss getting out uh, onto the property on a daily basis where you're working physically. Uh, I'm not quite as fit as I used to be. I still try to remain reasonably fit, but I was, you know, you, you, it's a great lifestyle and, 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 if you, and the rewards are there uh, if you can do this. Government no, couldn't agree more. Tony, I just want to finish by thanking you for the hard work that you're doing for the agricultural people. I know sometimes it must feel like you're banging your head against the wall, but don't worry, mate, we'll get you a bandage so that you can keep banging that <laughs> head against the wall. Um, keep those bastards honest in there, will you? And keep fighting for ag. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on, having a yarn on the farm today. And uh, on behalf of all farmers, um, thanks very much for, for the advocacy work that you're doing. Um, keep that pressure on, you know, along with a very able new leader of the opposition, David Crisofulli, who is also a son of a farmer. We, we can see there could be a light at the end of the tunnel and maybe there might be a couple of people in three years' time sitting around the table that have actually got a little bit of experience in farming. And for farmers, I think that'd be bloody great. Thanks, Rodney. And look, we're working really hard. And, and, and our leader, David, he's, he's a great fellow. I've had a great friendship with him for a long period of time. He's, he's focused, he's driven, uh, and, and he knows what this state needs uh, to reach its, reach its potential and, and to move into, you know, into the future. So, no, look, we back him. Uh, he's a great leader, and I'm, I'm pleased, pleased to be part of his team. Good on you, Tone. Thanks very much for having the yarn to us today, mate. All the very best. Thanks, Rodney. It's been a pleasure.